celebrate reaching 5,000 subscribers, I'm doing a bonus video, how to make the pizza for game night. Pizza doesn't require any fancy ingredients, so it's all about technique. In my opinion, the most important element of a great pizza is a great crust. So we're going to begin by making a high quality dough. Into some blood warm water, we are going to add our yeast. The yeast is alive, but in stasis. Rehydrating will wake it back up, we want to give them some food to make sure they're not dead. I prefer a dollop of honey over white sugar, both for the flavor and because of the emulsifiers present in the honey that have seeped in from the bee's wax making process. Later on, this will help in our gluten formation. Stir it up and set it aside to proof. Next up, we need bread flour. Bread flour has a higher protein content than all purpose, meaning it will eventually yield a stretchier dough. More on that later. I measure out four cups, but only add half of the last one. You have to judge the correct level of hydration based on your local conditions, but don't worry, I'll show you how. Of course, we need a little salt. Then mix it together and dig out a little well to add your wet ingredients. Bubbles indicate that our yeast is alive and well and metabolizing the sugar from the honey into CO2. Pour that into the well, then quickly add two tablespoons of high quality olive oil. Because we're adding such a small amount of fat to the dough, you have to make sure it's the good stuff. Why such a small amount of oil? Again, it's because of the gluten. Go ahead and mix that together with a spoon until you have a shaggy dough. Then turn it out on your work surface and begin to knead. Kneading is critical and you don't want to shortchange yourself. Have you ever wondered why you need dough? Gluten is composed of two types of protein, gliadins and glutenin. Glutenin forms massive oligomers of various subunits, and gliadin is essentially the endosperm storage method for proline, the chain breaker. Which all of our protein biochemists will know makes gliadin both highly irregular and insoluble in water. The formation of gluten proper begins with mixing in water to partially hydrate and unfold the protein, exposing the internal cysteines in their very useful sulfur containing group. The partial unfolding also exposes some nonpolar phases, which cause the gluten proteins to come together and associate via hydrophobic interactions. Then, stronger disulfide bonds are formed from the now free cysteines between adjacent gluten proteins. Both the hydrophobic interaction and the disulfide bind these proteins together into larger gluten superstructures, but kneading the dough further aligns and cross-links the gluten proteins, creating a, here we go, developed gluten network capable of retaining the expanding gas bubbles. The glutenin oligomers themselves have some inherent elasticity, which are now connected to neighboring proteins by disulfide bonds, meaning that kinetic energy and straining force physically stretches out these spring-like proteins, creating stress on the disulfide bonds, which eventually break them. Breaking these bonds allows the proteins to relax, but because they're still in wet no being needed, new disulfide bonds get formed with neighboring proteins. This is the reason dough becomes more elastic as it is needed, and we need a highly elastic, highly developed gluten network to both stretch out our dough thin enough to be a pizza without tearing, and trap all the gases produced, both the CO2 from the yeast metabolism and the steam from the bake. This will make our all-important crust light and airy on the edges, yet thin and crispy in the middle just how we like it. So why did we add so little oil? How does the inclusion of fats inhibit the formation of gluten? Well, large particles of oil get attracted to the hydrophobic regions of the glutenin and gliadin. This physically prevents gluten proteins from making contact, thus resulting in gluten aggregates that are smaller and shorter than they would otherwise be. This is why adding lots of fat to a dough creates a crumbly texture that Paul Hollywood would call very short. Now, did you need to know all that? No. But this is my vanity video, and these are the sorts of things that I think about outside the hobby. Now you know. Kneading is critical, and you don't want to shortchange yourself. So go ahead and set a timer and knead for a full 20 minutes, adding flour as needed, making sure to throw your body weight in as you roll the dough. And even if you're using a stand mixer, I would recommend finishing off by hand, just so you can get a feel for the dough's consistency. The dough should be elastic enough that you can stretch it and light will pass through, and hydrated enough that if you press it, it will bounce back. Using a very sharp knife or a dough cutter, slice your dough in two, then tuck and stretch the rest of the ball over the new cut until you have two taunt balls. We're gonna pour a generous amount of olive oil into an airtight container. Now that we've developed our gluten, we can be a bit more generous with our fats. Smear it around, then we're gonna put our dough in, first upside down to oil up the top, then flip it over, seal it, and put it in your fridge. Instead of a container, you can use an oiled bowl and struggle with the cling wrap. In either case, once sealed, put it in your fridge to ferment. Why? Well, normally yeast wants to be just like you and me. It wants to eat carbohydrates, breathe in oxygen, and expel CO2. And that's what it's doing in our dough. It's eating bits of flour and creating pockets of gas in the process. However, yeast is very cool in that if we starve it of oxygen, it gets really creative with its metabolic pathways to survive, which leads to some delicious outcomes for us. More importantly for history, anaerobic fermentation will yield alcohol 
While the majority is evaporated during baking, some of the produced ethanol goes into great side reaction to create these rich flavor compounds we all love. Additionally, the yeast is also going to produce a bunch of tasty keto bodies as it shifts away from oxidative phosphorylation, and it's going to catabolize some amino acids. Most notably, leucine is just a simple deamination away from this metabolically useful keto that the yeast wants to use to make NADH. But when we bake it, it will quickly decarboxylate to give us this 3-methylbutanal, which is the rich malt flavor. So, how long should you let it ferment? At least 40 hours, and no more than 72. In my experience, there really isn't a difference in taste between a two hour rise and an overnight rise, but the difference in results between overnight and a full 40 hours is night and day. Your gluten will have continued to develop as more bonds continue to form, you'll have more CO2 trapped as the yeast have been active longer, and the yeast will have gone a while without oxygen, yielding this incredible depth of flavor we just talked about. So, if you love your players, you'll ferment your dough. But you can't go on forever. Too much time and the gluten will overdevelop, it will have stretched and recoiled so much that it loses the elasticity needed to trap gas. Yeast can survive in like 12% alcohol, but too much alcohol ruins the gluten network because gliadin and glutenin are more soluble in alcohol and thus do not partially unfold as needed to make contact with other proteins as they do in water. Now I am loath to give up my sauce recipe just weeks before the Boss the Sauce competition at the family reunion, but I doubt Uncle Bob watches this channel so I think the secret's safe. We're going to start with four cloves of fresh garlic that need to cut off the ends, remove any germinating stems, and crush. Why crush? Because the thing that gives garlic its pungent taste only gets activated when the garlic is crushed or chopped. It's supposed to be a defense mechanism against getting eaten by animals, but we humans are a bit masochistic when it comes to our food. But how does that crushing make the flavor? The garlic plant converts large amounts of the amino acid cysteine to a derivative called allein and stores that in its cells. Those same cells have large storage vacuoles with an enzyme, a little chemical machine called alleinase. When the garlic is crushed, the vacuoles rupture and the alleinase converts the allein to allyl sulfinic acid, two molecules of which spontaneously condense, that is, they pop off a water molecule in order to power the formation of a new chemical bond, and yield a single molecule of allicin. Allicin is very unstable and rapidly decomposes, the major product being diallyl disulfide, our classic garlic flavor. But we're going to go one step further and roast our garlic. This is going to give our garlic a smoother, more complex taste by letting the alicin turn into other compounds, including a joine, the smooth, oniony flavor through this multi-step reaction involving two alicins, and vinyl dithians, which are the dyes alder products of alicins cleaving and reforming. Roasting also promotes the caramelization of whatever fructose rings are in the garlic through our friendly Maillard reaction. All of this is just a long way of saying, if you love your players, you'll roast your garlic. Next up is sweet onion finely diced, and I keep going until I have about one cup. Over very low heat, we're going to warm two tablespoons of olive oil. Press the garlic directly into your pan. Stir it around a bit, making sure the oil covers the garlic, that way the flavors get into the oil. And be very careful not to let it burn. If it gets close, you can dump in your onions to absorb some of that heat. Let's talk about tomatoes, the real keto good pasta sauce. Now, you could score, boil, blanch, and peel some tomatoes, but your best bet is to probably use canned. Grocery store tomatoes are picked while they are under ripe, so they won't be rotten by the time the consumer gets them. In contrast, canned tomatoes are picked at peak ripeness, so they've had time to develop all those rich flavors on the vine. So unless you're using tomatoes from your own backyard or a farmer's market, canned San Marzano tomatoes are the way to go. You could add your canned tomatoes straight into the pot and start smushing them around with a spoon, but I like to cheat and use a blender. One pulse for chunky, two pulses for smooth. Next, open both sides of a can of tomato paste and push it through and into the pot. For your volatiles, I would recommend using a cheap red wine, a very nice bourbon, or what I've been favoring is red wine that I've soured into vinegar. This is a dry Chianti that I've let oxidize over the past six months. And to balance out that bite we just gave it, I'm gonna use one heaping tablespoon of brown sugar. I prefer brown over white because of the emulsifiers and the molasses will help pull those flavors dissolved in the oil into the rest of the sauce. Mix it all up, then we're gonna move on to spices. We want a half teaspoon of black pepper, half teaspoon of oregano, about a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes, and then one and a half heaping teaspoons of dried basil. And the secret is just a pinch of Aunt Jackie's Italian seasoning. We're gonna go ahead and tiny whisk those all together for brand recognition, then add them to our sauce. Mix it all around, and by this time you'll have noticed it starts to smell pretty good. If you're just making sauce for pizza, you do not need to let it simmer for long because it's going to bake in the oven. But if you're going to make leftovers, like this recipe does, I let it go for about 30 minutes. And near the end of the cooking time, we add our one teaspoon of salt. 
Why do we salt at the end? Because you want to adjust your final flavor, not your developing one. Now on to the cheese. This part might be controversial, but I'm going to use low moisture part skim mozzarella. The reason I'm using part skim is that it seeps out less oil when baked, and it's also going to brown quicker, which is what we want because our crust is going to cook so quickly. And of course, you should shred your cheese. Pre-shredded cheese is covered in cornstarch, which ruins its meltability. So if you love your players, you'll shred it by hand. We're also going to make our mozzarella into a real pizza blend with some other cheeses I have lying around. We're going to shred in a little bit of Parmesan and a little bit of Romero, Asiago, Asiago. And finally, we have some high moisture, high fat, fresh mozzarella. This is going to melt really well, but you want to be careful not to overdo it. Too much moisture will give you a soggy crust. So only use just a little and cut it into really thin strips. Then stick your cheese in the fridge. Colder cheese is going to melt better and expel less oil. To properly bake our pizza, we are going to need some special equipment. First among these is a pizza stone. If you eat pizza a lot, frozen, reheated, whatever, just go out and get one of these. It's $25 and it's gonna change your life. Next up is a cast iron skillet. We wanna get as much heat in our oven as possible and this is gonna go a long way to retaining and reflecting some of the heat down onto our pizza. My preferred setup is stone on the bottom, cast iron skillet right above it. And we want to get our oven hot, the stone, the skillet, all of this to try to get as much heat into our oven as possible because we want our pizza to bake fast enough that all the moisture turns into steam that will get trapped in all those gluten networks we worked so hard to build without seeping away. Let your oven continue to preheat for at least an hour after reaching temperature. That way your stone and your skillet have had time to get hot too. If you love your players, you'll get your oven as hot as you can. While your oven is heating, take out your fermented dough, form it into a ball, and let it come to room temperature. Cold dough is much harder to work with. Finally, we have a pizza peel, which we are going to use to get our pizza onto our 500 degree pizza stone. To get the pizza to slide off the peel, we're going to cover it in corn flour. The corn flour is going to act like little ball bearings and help your pizza slide off of the peel and into the oven. Don't be shy. You've worked all this time to make a beautiful pizza, and if it sticks to the peel as you try to put it in the oven, it will be ruined. Because your dough is very moist, it's going to want to stick to the peel, so you have to work quickly. I recommend getting all of your ingredients gathered ahead of time. Grabbing your ball of dough with your thumbs, start rotating it in the air like you're driving a bus, letting gravity stretch it into a circle. While you're rotating the dough, be careful not to pinch down on about a two inch gap around the edge. This is going to form your crust and you don't want to squeeze out all the air bubbles you work so hard to make. You can stretch it out a little bit using your fingertips, but don't press it down into the peel. You want to keep it from sticking. I pierce the middle of the pizza with a fork to let moisture out so the middle bakes crisp. Then I baste the pizza in olive oil all the way to the edge. This is going to help our crust brown and it's going to act as a barrier, preventing the moisture from our toppings from making the middle of our pizza soggy. Then go ahead and drop on a healthy ladle full of sauce, spreading it around almost to the edge. In contrast, when we put in our cheese, we want to go all the way to the edge. That's what's going to give our crust that classic pizzeria brown. Lastly, we're going to add our fresh mozzarella on top. Then in a swift motion, keeping your peel parallel to the stone, you'll slide your pizza into the oven. Then bake it till your cheese just barely begins to brown. Click a pair of tongs twice just to check that they're working. Then pull your pizza out of the oven onto your peel. To preserve the crispiness, we're going to put it on a cooling rack until it stops steaming. Then we're going to admire our handiwork. The edge of the pizza is golden and crisp on the outside, but soft and chewy on the inside. The cheese is melty and delicious, the sauce rich and savory, and I 100% assure you this pizza tastes as wonderful as it looks. The perfect addition to game night.